February 21st, Hong Kong. A doctor from southern China arrives for a family wedding. Whether he knows it or not, he is sick, carrying a mysterious new virus. He checks in to the Metropole Hotel, the ninth floor. And over the next 24 hours, he spreads the virus to at least 12 other hotel guests. The next day, the doctor's condition worsens. He goes to a Hong Kong hospital. But the people he's infected go to Hong Kong's airport. The virus is about to take flight. Headed for Singapore, Hanoi, and Toronto. Within weeks, panic. Healthcare systems around the world are in crisis. The virus, still a mystery, has proven deadly. The Chinese doctor is dead. And soon, more than 700 others will die of severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. Almost as quickly as the virus spread, the demand for answers grew. It was becoming clear the disease had been festering for months in southern China. Why had there been no warnings, no alerts? How was the virus allowed to escape to Hong Kong and from here to so many places around the world? The search for answers inevitably leads you here, to Geneva, Switzerland, home to luxury shopping and the headquarters of dozens of UN agencies. Among the largest and most respected, the World Health Organization, the WHO. A mammoth bureaucracy with a workforce of 5,000 and an annual budget of $2.2 billion. Dr. Heyman, hi. Until recently, Dr. David Heyman was the boss of the communicable disease program here. Long before SARS, he says, the WHO realized that individual countries by themselves were not going to stop fatal diseases from spreading. The first indication that we had that there was something not right in the world was when the Ebola outbreak occurred in Kikwit, and a year before that, the plague outbreak occurred in India. The WHO has always had a mandate to protect the world against disease, but three years ago, after a series of global epidemics, it decided it had to do better. It had to become more proactive. So it set up a new worldwide surveillance program to identify diseases as they emerge and to stop them before they have a chance to spread. Every day at 9 a.m., the WHO's top disease detectives meet in this building. No, it's, uh, uh, their work is so sensitive, they wouldn't let us film inside their room. But they gave us this videotape. Their job is to verify outbreaks. Any report, even a rumor, has to be tracked down because they know inaction costs lives. We've set up a system, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, which is there to respond to infectious diseases. We've also set up a whole system of disease detection around the world. So with all of that at their disposal, how did the WHO not catch SARS before it spread? Their answer, echoed in headlines around the world, was China. China, say its critics, chose to save face rather than save lives. China was too secretive, said the WHO. It knew about SARS as early as last November, but didn't share the information. The Chinese knew about the outbreak, but ordered silence. As one WHO official put it to the New York Times. In December and January, it was dead silence from China. That was that. And as Times reporter Donald McNeil explained, dead silence had deadly consequences. Well, I mean, if China had admitted what was going on in November or December or January or early February, then presumably that doctor would not have left southern China and he never would have infected those 12 people in the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. So the disease would never have gone to Canada, it never would have gone to Vietnam, it never would have gone to Singapore, it would have gone to a lot of other places that it went. The WHO says once they knew how serious SARS was, they did everything they could, issuing a global alert in mid-March and later warning travelers to stay away from southern China. We must take the precautionary measures now. It is now we have a chance to contain it 
and you have to use public health uh, tools to do so. A steadfast and determined World Health Organization fighting off a mysterious and deadly disease, all in the face of enormous Chinese secrecy. That's the image the WHO has worked hard to cultivate. But take a closer look at the period before the SARS crisis and a very different picture emerges. The fact is, China and the WHO had a close working relationship for years. You'd never know it from the way the WHO talked that they actually had an office in China. They do in Beijing with a staff of 30. What's more, the WHO has spent millions over the years training Chinese scientists and building a massive influenza detection network. After all, 80 percent of new flus start in China. If you're in the business of spotting new strains of flu or any other emerging disease, there's no place more important to watch than here. This is Guangdong province in southern China, what the scientists call pandemic central. Guangdong uh, has a very high population density, very many animals are living there, mm -hmm. uh, very close proximity to humans, and that's the, the ideal breeding ground for the emergence of pandemic influenza viruses. Guangdong province is of particular interest to Dr. Klaus Storr. He heads the WHO's influenza team. Last fall, he traveled from Geneva to Beijing to attend a conference, and so began the story of the WHO and SARS the three crucial months before the deadly disease escaped from China. It all began at that conference. A health official from Guangdong was worried. A new highly infectious respiratory illness was spreading in his city. He told Klaus Dorr that not only were patients dying, healthcare workers were getting sick too. For Storr, that set off alarm bells. That was a case of concern because Healthcare workers are normally healthy adults mm -hmm. in the prime of their life, and um, severe disease of influenza in these age groups is, is relatively rare. The fact that he mentioned healthcare workers uh, were being affected and, and were, were dying, did he say they were dying? He, he talked about deaths, very severe uh, disease and deaths. So looking back, do you think that this was an early incidence of SARS? Uh, looking at the epidemiological data, it's, it's relatively likely. A likely outbreak of SARS as early as November and a WHO official was in the loop. This was exactly the kind of tip the WHO was supposed to track down. But who did Dr. Storr tell? Not this man. Dr. Yi Guan runs a WHO partner lab in Hong Kong, right next door to Guangdong province. If something was wrong there, he'd be in a position to check it out. But Dr. Storr didn't tell him anything. He went to this conference, he stopped in Hong Kong, and you met with him. Yeah. And he said nothing to you about what no, was happening? No, no, we, Yeah. If, if we know that the unusual happening, we immediately have a meeting here. We need to say, OK, we, what do we should do? And he wasn't the only one who didn't know. Dr. Storr didn't even tell the WHO's man in charge of disease surveillance in the Beijing office. He's Dr. Alan Schnur. He certainly didn't, didn't uh, raise it strongly at that time. There's no emails, there's no written correspondence that I'm aware of. But if, if, if in November you had been told that there's an atypical pneumonia that was affecting healthcare workers, would that have affected the way anybody dealt with this, do you think? The, uh, if we had known earlier, then I would have taken action earlier. But Klaus Storr says further action wasn't necessary. He'd seen official flu reports out of Guangdong, which showed nothing unusual. By his own admission, Storr never found out what happened to those healthcare workers. But did you not hear? Here was this man who'd stood up in a meeting and said he was worried about an unusual outbreak, large numbers of, of people being affected, uh, healthcare workers. You say it set off alarm bells. Mm -hmm. Did you never think to get back in touch with them and find out what happened to those healthcare workers? No, actually, we, we, we certainly think about asking these questions, but double joke or not, in one of the many hundred and thousand outbreaks, follow up on each of every case. To this day, do you know the name of that doctor that got up at that meeting from Guangzhou? Uh, none of us bothered to mm -hmm. find out where the, where, where, this, it, it's an important person now, uh, but the information is more important. Two months before that Chinese doctor checked into the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, 
the virus was creeping into Guangzhou, the capital of Guangdong province and its largest city. At the main respiratory disease hospital. We have actually worked out that guy. Dr. Zhang Neng Chen was about to see his first case. The first case of SARS, and this is a, a, a case coming from a small city called Heian. It wouldn't be long before his critical care ward was filled with patients. Officials in Guangdong say they did tell Beijing about the outbreaks. The WHO insists Beijing never told them. Still, anyone reading Chinese news reports last winter would have known that something was going on in Guangdong. Outbreaks of unidentified viruses and atypical pneumonias. There was also a report of an emergency late night meeting and a run on antiviral medicines. And if that wasn't enough, the WHO had another chance to find information. In early January, six weeks before the Metropole Hotel, a Chinese scientist trained by the WHO was in Guangdong, helping the Chinese government investigate the mysterious new disease. He was part of a program the WHO had helped set up and fund. Dr. Alan Schnur sits on the program's board. But did you ever think to pick up the phone and, and ask them what they were doing? The, we have regular contacts with them. We, we don't pick up the phone every week to say what's on your schedule for this, uh, for this week. But in regular contacts, did, did this ever come up that they were looking into cases of atypical pneumonia affecting healthcare workers? It, it didn't come up during discussions and I, I was not actively asking, do you have any cases of atypical pneumonia? But four weeks before the virus would spread to the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, something did come up, this. The Chinese call it a red letter, a warning sent out by Guangdong health officials to every hospital and clinic in the province. They still didn't know what was causing people to get sick, but they did understand there was only one way to stop it from spreading, isolation, quarantine. They had to work out a, a document and said this is an um, unusual disease, very infectious or as contagious. Is there's no antibiotics available for the treatment of this disease. If you have this kind of uh, patient, you, uh, you should have some, uh, make some uh, isolation. The WHO says this was critical information. If they'd known the Chinese were dealing with something as serious as this, they say, they could have acted earlier. In Geneva, they insist that no one from the WHO saw the red letter until months later in April. But when we asked Alan Schnur about it, he said he did see some kind of hospital warning as early as the beginning of February. I, I don't have the, the document uh, in front of me, but that was from one hospital, and that was, uh, that was shared by the friend. But that was received by me. I saw that during the week of 10 February. The week of February 10th, a critical week in the SARS chronology. Now the world would learn that a mysterious disease was on the loose in southern China. And how did the world learn? Not from the Chinese and not from the WHO, but from this man, Dr. Stephen Cunyon, a retired U.S. Navy epidemiologist living in suburban Washington. On February 10th, he received an email. A friend had heard from someone in Guangzhou where fear was gripping the city. There were people dying all around the city that the government had locked people out of the hospitals and people were essentially rioting and that he wanted to know what he could do. So Cunyon sent out a query on an internet message board for healthcare workers. I put in the form of a question uh, to see if anybody would respond to it. Yeah. And then you know, when that same day, there was multiple people responding saying, hey, there is something wrong. And that started the whole ball rolling. The next day, health authorities in Guangdong province admitted they had a problem. An outbreak of a mysterious acute respiratory syndrome had killed five people and infected more than 300. Whether those numbers reflected the true extent of the problem or not, the word was out and the WHO had a window of opportunity to act. It would still be 10 days before the virus reached Hong Kong. They could have issued a global alert. They could have warned the rest of the world to screen travelers coming from Guangdong province, but they didn't. In the end, the WHO fell back on protocol.
It would be irresponsible to put out a global alert without having the information we needed. We ask the question officially, but we can't force a country to answer. We can only tell a country why it's important to report, which we did. But the, the, the China office tells us, and I think it makes sense, mm -hmm. that they have a whole network of, of contacts, both Absolutely. formal and informal. Mm -hmm. Alan Schneer tells us he can pick up the phone and call anybody in Guangdong. Mm -hmm. Couldn't he have found out what the signs and symptoms were? Certainly he could have, but he didn't. Um, there was always the option to pick up the phone and telephone to people in, uh, in Guangdong province in the uh, provincial CDC. But why didn't you then? The, we were getting information officially uh, at that time from the, uh, the Ministry of Health. That's, that's always a concern uh, in uh, working in, in all countries that one wants to maintain good communications with, uh, with staff and, and again not to, to have a situation where they may be releasing restricted information that hasn't been approved. If all this sounds like bureaucracy and politics, it is, says the man who alerted the world to SARS. In his 30 years investigating disease outbreaks, Dr. Cunyon got to know the WHO very well. You don't get into the club without uh, political connections or uh, working your way up through the ranks. And uh, so it's a cl very close group of people that um, wine and dine together. The, the problems are settled uh, like in a uh, men's club in London, you know. And gentlemen, he says, think twice before sanctioning the fastest growing economy in the world. You don't go chap, slap in hands of a country that has more people than anybody else and, and tremendous uh, resources behind them because you don't want to go offending these people when you don't have to. And so with no global alerts in place, no travel advisories, there was nothing to stop that Chinese doctor from traveling to Hong Kong. Nothing to stop the virus escaping and all those people dying. A mysterious form of pneumonia the kills pneumonia -like two in Canada. The pneumonia-like illness has killed 17 people around the world, it's including deadly, three in it's Canada. It's highly contagious and it's already spread to three continents on airliners. In the end, it wasn't until March 12th, three months after those first early warnings, that the WHO issued a global alert. A travel advisory against southern China would take three weeks more. By then, SARS was a global crisis. 62 people were dead, 1,800 more had been infected. For all their earlier talk of stopping diseases before they spread, the WHO still insists it couldn't have done anything sooner. The man in charge of communicable diseases, Dr. David Heyman. With respect, Dr. Heyman, mm -hmm. you knew in November, December, mm -hmm. and January this was a lethal disease. You knew in November, December, and January mm -hmm. that healthcare workers were being affected and dying. Mm -hmm. You knew, and or you had the ability to know from the Guangdong authorities what they had assessed this disease to be and how they were treating it. So what was different by... China, like Canada, is a sovereign state. We can only deal with China as its own sovereign state. And we talked with them about the outbreak. We told them. We asked them for information. They gave us information. But there, there was that period of a couple of weeks where one could argue that this could have been stopped. It may not have spread. We do not have a mandate to stop a disease occurring in a country. You said that the reason you couldn't put the, any travel alert in place is you didn't understand what it was. It would be irresponsible to do No, that. our mandate, I said, is international. When a disease begins to spread internationally, that's when WHO's mandate begins. In April, China apologized to the world for not being more open about SARS. <laughs> Several Chinese officials, including the Minister of Health, lost their jobs. In Geneva, however, the World Health Organization conducted an internal review and concluded its handling of SARS was just fine.